Eyes on Whiteness is a podcast that illuminates the insidious and ignorant ways of whiteness, regardless of intent. Our guests are invited to talk about the ways white supremacy and patriarchy are pervasive and ever-present. Our conversations are rooted in a commitment to normalizing the how, not if, lens for looking at the ways it's present for all of us. If you'd like to support us, we'd greatly appreciate it. You can find us on Patreon, Eyes on Whiteness. I'm your host, Maureen Benson, and sometimes I'll be joined by Deidre Barber, who will only show up when she feels like it. The podcast is produced by the brilliant and kind Aaron Rand Freeman. We're excited to welcome you to the show. Sonia Renee Taylor is the founder and radical executive officer of The Body Is Not An Apology, a digital media and education company promoting radical self-love and body empowerment as the foundational tool for social justice and global transformation. Sonia's work as a highly sought after award-winning performance poet, activist, and transformational leader continues to have global reach. Sonia is a former national and international poetry slam champion, author of two books, including The Body Is Not An Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love, an educator and thought leader who has enlightened and inspired organizations, audiences, and individuals from boardrooms to prisons, universities to homeless shelters, elementary schools to some of the biggest stages in the world. Okay, that's the bio on the website, but let me take a minute and tell you about my sister. I had the great luck to meet Sonia a little over 10 years ago, initially through the poetry community, but quickly we became best friends, often living together for months at a time as she stayed with me during an annual residency before we convinced her to move to Oakland, before she then left and went to New Zealand, but that's another story. I have been so blessed to get to be in the presence of her brilliance, where we regularly unpack our own transformational process and support each other through the powerful ups and downs of breakdowns and breakthroughs. Sonia embodies to me the level of humanity and authenticity I aspire to and wish for all of us. So enjoy today's podcast with this special treat of Sonia Renee Taylor. I'm literally showering a day, once a day at least, but sometimes twice a day. It's really, it's fascinating. And I'm typically your like, oh, it's been three days. I should put some water on my ass kind of girl. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What about the quarantine has you showering more? That's amazing. I I, I don't, I I don't think it's the quarantine. I told you I'm in some weird, I'm, I'm in some weird thing where I'm just being told to do things. And so one of them is wash your ass every day. Wash your ass. The ancestors are telling you to wash your ass every day. The ancestors are like, get up and wash your ass. (laughs) That's what you're going to (laughs) do. That's why you kiss my ass and I'm like, are these spirits whispered in your ear? Like what? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Hey, Sonia. You stink. Go take a shower. All right. Well, I have a confession. (laughs) (laughs) Because I knew I was getting on a call with you all, for some reason in my shower today, I was way more mindful to scrub my legs. (laughs) Bravo. 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 May may it pass to your people. (laughs) It's not on my radar. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Ask your people. Oh, my goodness. Deidre, uh, I miss you. I know it's been, I, what, it's been, I don't even know how long. A long ass time. I hear you in like paradise and shit. <laughs> <laughs> like me. And Sometimes, yeah. Really? I mean, it could, it could certainly be mistaken as such. And then, you know, but real life meets you no matter how pretty the place. This so. is true. This is true. But is it always green? It's always green, right? It is incredibly green right now. It was, it was starting to get pretty brown. We were in a pretty bad drought over the summer. Um, but that led up, I guess, about a month ago. So now, yes, it's back to lush and green. That's so amazing. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I get what you're saying. Like, you know, grass is always greener on the other side. Um, and also, like, I actually don't know how much it would benefit me. Like, I, I love green and lush, 
but I do feel like there's a possibility it could force me to go deep into a place. Like you might, you'd be like, where's Deidre? You're in a mud hole underneath a tree. We haven't seen it before. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's real that's real talk here i think i'm certainly more of a recluse than i've ever been in the entirety of my life having moved here like i'm i i'm on some deep isolation shit that i've never been on before <laughs> i was like i used to be an extrovert and now i'm like people who needs them so, <laughs> so what what kind of quarantine do you all have there like what's in we zealand, in new zealand in case we decide to put this in yes new zealand yes we're there we're in new zealand we're in new zealand um so they instituted a four level sort of system i really appreciated the way that they did it which is that they came on tv and the prime minister was like so you know we're going to use a system that we're familiar with if there are an earthquake warning if there's a, you know potential any other natural disaster what we would do is we would have a, a level system the same level system that we have for those we're going to institute that here so today we're on level two level two means we should be social distancing we should be and it was just this very clear beautiful you know description and then they, were, they had already put stop talking words. stop talking stop talking you're making way too much sense there's like a fucking you have an understanding of what what you're supposed to do there's lack of <laughs> chaos what's happening i don't know what you're saying your mouth is moving but i don't know what know. you're saying <laughs> yeah, i know it's all it's i mean when i saw it because i had just come back from the states i was like wow this is drastically different <laughs> and what was interesting is when i first came back there were only five cases the day i got on my flight there were five cases in New Zealand. So when I came back, I was doing my little two-week quarantine, just, you know, self-quarantine. And I was like, New Zealand's acting like this isn't coming here. Why is y'all chilling? Why is, why is everybody chilling? And then I realized that it was like, the country was chill. People were chilling, but it was also that the U.S. was in such chaos. And what New Zealand was doing was in the background prepping, like, what is the best way to roll this out? Because... It's coming here. Like, we've got to figure out how we want to roll this out in a way that is actually sustainable, you know, and actually gets people, causes the least amount of death, destruction, and chaos as possible. Yeah. And they did it. They did an excellent job in terms of the way that they rolled it out. You, you had the level two. They said, this can change daily. So you should listen daily. There were already commercials with celebrities. Like, together, we beat COVID-19. <laughs> like, literally, it was already. <laughs> they were singing was, Imagine. Imagine all the people. They weren't singing. <laughs> no, their was privilege no one was singing Imagine. <laughs> So anyway, we are now at level four. We've been at level four for, well, I'm sorry. We were at level four for a month. Yesterday, we dropped down to level three. Um, level three means that, like, you can order takeout. I was so excited. I ordered Indian food yesterday. You can't tell me shit. <laughs> I've never been excited about some korma and some naan, some garlic naan more in my whole life. It was it. Oh, it was like eating a bite of heaven to just yeah. eat some food. Girl, I, I ordered have. a pizza for the first time the other day. I felt so bad. I t I literally tipped the guy fifty percent of the cost of the pizza. I was like, <laughs> just take it. Just here's twenty five dollars. The cost the pizza cost twelve, but here's twenty five dollars. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> front lines. That's, that's yeah. that front line tip. You on the front lines, homie, with just working at Papa John's. Yeah. This shit is. <laughs> Wild. I'm sure nobody ever at Papa John's thought that they were gonna getting ready to sign up for a job that involved like their actual mortality on the line. No, and but still, and people still people have to deal. People. Right, but we won't give people a, a cross the board fifteen dollar minimum wage, and still have to deal no. with people, you know, coming in there treating them like they're trash. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, yeah, it's, it's wild. It's bananas. It would be amazing if universally we decided to take a look at how perspective changes so rapidly and how what that's done to our values and wow look at the will of the people and the institution when those values and those perspectives shift because we didn't get right. fucks about these folks not three months ago not we even still three months give ago. a fuck about them what's not like right. come on True. we still know i just read a story that amazon is rolling back like they at first they had all this stuff where you can take two weeks off or unlimited time <laughs> unlimited unpaid time off so you can just not come but you won't lose your job well amazon just deleted that like that that actually doesn't exist anymore 
which is, which is know, why this morning I, you know, Maureen and I were talking about having stuff so that we can do more video. And I was like, I do, I'll spend 18 hours online video, uh, researching how I can get stuff and not use Amazon. It's possible. Yeah. You gotta do a lot yeah. of research. <laughs> right. If, 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 I mean, but isn't that fascinating how quickly it's gone to like, Oh, in order to get something without Amazon, you have to put in hours and hours and hours of labor, right? Like the amount of sort of global control that that, and that's, I mean, that's the thing I've been thinking about in this whole uh, COVID situation is like, there are literally eight people in the world who could cover the entire economic impact of COVID, including Jeff Bezos, right? Like everybody's job, there could be no mortgage, you know, issues, like literally could cover the entire economic outcome of this pandemic on the world. There are eight people in the planet who could do that. Well, and here's the other thing too. Literally money is not real. So right. you could just stop playing the game for a little while. You could like, just <laughs> you know, like we're not, you know, like, and you know, we're throwing food out. Like farmers are literally throwing food out and and letting milk run down drains, and you know, like it's wild. So like, while well, people are still starving, but that's how committed, you know, that's how committed everyone is to the illusion that capitalism is, right? Yes. Like when I when I saw those protesters who are like protesting for the right to come back to work, and I was like what the hell? But I got it. I was like, so I, I did a video on Instagram where I was talking about, you know, like this idea of like, you know, Christians and COVID is the devil. And I was like, no, capitalism is the devil. <laughs> capitalism is the devil. And COVID is, you know, the universal goods attempt to stop us from fucking worshiping the devil. And what we're looking at are people out in protest for their right to worship the devil. Right. Like to literally worship that which defines them, because to sit at home without working is to be like, who the fuck am I? If and it is not this. If you really wanted to go to work, <laughs> there's like there's just acres and acres of fields that have no people to fucking pick the food that's going past. You could get out there. And right. Get but then you would have to be then you would have to be the people that it is you think are less than you. You're better. right. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's wild to watch it. It has been fascinating. <laughs> yeah. It is fascinating. I liked, I liked that you picked the devil uh, specifically because people are out protesting, not understanding the irony of, no, damn it, I need to be the white devil. <laughs> that is my place. <laughs> that is my place. You saw that white lady that got arrested in Idaho? Oh, no. Uh-uh. You know, these white women got together and held a protest play date at the playground. And they showed up with, with their, their kids. kids, with their children, all the kids playing on the playground. Two cops walk up. They're like, everybody got to go. You can go out on the grass. If you practice social distancing, you're not allowed on the playground. Let's go. And these white women got indignant. You can't take away our constitutional right. Blah, blah, blah. Like, to yeah, play on the playground. <laughs> I love that the Constitution all of a sudden covers all kind of shit it never covered before. These swing sets is covered by the Constitution. <laughs> Are you going to give us back our taxes? We paid to be here. And this cop goes, I mean, if you don't get off these goddamn monkey bars and shut the fuck up. <laughs> so finally, this cop who was firm, but really not rude, was just like, look, you need right. to go. I mean, big signs everywhere. You don't have to be so rude about it. He's like, I'm not rude. I told you three times to get off the playground. And then he did a lap. And this other cop was like, sorry guys it's for the corona like he felt he minimized science to appease these white women right yeah meanwhile none of them are using protective gear everybody's just out there right so anyway finally that first cop circles back and he says uh, look i'm done you got five seconds to get off this playground four three Two, and this white woman turns around back up to him with her hands with her hands behind her back and says well then arrest me and so he proceeds to arrest her. And when I tell you the shitstorm that ensued because he had the audacity to detain her, I mean, the white woman filming was like hysterical. How, why is she being detained? How dare you? Like screaming at this cop. Bitch, you backed up to him. Put your hands right. in the back. Your arms? With your arms folded over <laughs> in the arrest me position, wondering why you're being arrested. Yeah. When you would have been dead had you been three black people on that playground, <laughs> you would have been. 
the disconnect, the disconnect in that mind, like in the white mind of like what you're entitled to and when you're entitled to it and like how you can't connect in Idaho of all places, Idaho. Like, you know, there's places where you and me, Sonia, we can't walk through Idaho. We'll never make it fucking out. We will never make it out alive and no one will do anything about it. You yeah. will not turn around and be like, arrest me before you kill this black person simply for being black. She's going to be nowhere to be fucking found. But so she like, over here protesting the monkey bars, though. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, wild. it's wild, the privilege of complete ignorance and disconnection yeah. from humanity that whiteness affords white people, and they don't even know it. Yeah, and that's, and that's like that, just like you said, that level of entitlement, that, like, everything belongs everything belongs to me and how dare you tell me it doesn't That's and right. every experience is mine to have regardless of how it might impact anybody else like this real deep deep it, belief in like individualism right like that uh, somehow your behavior that your covid germs aren't on these monkey bars now <laughs> somebody else is gonna get you know like and, you know and the so likelihood that that freaking playground is built on native land like some sort of ritual land like it's on 100 percent in like, idaho 100 i mean anywhere yeah but that's okay right. that's okay let's let's just do that's okay let's not even think about everything's it. mine it's all mine they it's all mine exist. they're invisible they don't exist they don't exist <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty mind-boggling. It's a trip. Um, I mean, it's, it's, almost, it's like the litmus test of what happens to a white person when you tell them no. Go on. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> hold, hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly i mean and that's what we're looking at you know on a widespread scale is like what happens when you tell the structures of whiteness no right and and the structures of whiteness are like absolutely not open the jams we're going to the beach and it's this interesting moment where what we're going i deeply believe in the whole of my being that we're in this for a long time and we're super in it for a long time now because we won't be in the short, we won't be in the short term crunch, right? Like if you just would sit your ass down, then <laughs> what I said was, I was like, oh, if ever we wonder whether or not God was a black woman, coronavirus is the answer. I said, sit your ass down. <laughs> Don't get up. I swear, and I said what I said. <laughs> and we about to get the I said what I said part because everybody's like, nope, I'm not listening, right? Whiteness is like, no. And the structures of whiteness are like, we will not be deterred from the things it is that define us because there is such a lack of, of, of internal self-definition, right? There is actually such a lack of knowing oneself that all of these external things are how we know ourselves. And when they are stripped, we have a complete and total breakdown, complete and total crisis. And so I'm gonna rebel against actually having to figure out and know myself yeah. And then we're going to be in it for the long haul because it's just going to cause a resurgence of the, uh, the virus and there is going to be massive death. And of course, unfortunately, the people most impacted will always be the people most impacted, right? Yeah. Black and brown folks, dis, you know, disabled folks, all of the communities that are already you know, barely making it. I mean, um, I, I have definitely had the thought of the reason a lot of these governors won't close stuff is an attempt at genocide. It's like, well, if we're hearing all these new, like, I'm like, could people stop talking about, like, is there a way for us to get protected and yet no one really know that our numbers are so high as terms of black right. and poor people? Yeah. Right. That's how evil some of these folks are. Like that's that thought process of like, well, it's not really affecting us too much, and it's a way we've always wanted to get rid of them. Mm -hmm. it's a way to get rid of them, and I don't, yeah. and I'm still unsure as to, I, I'm, I'm unsure as to what I read and see is real and what is not, because everything is filtered, right? Everything is through a lens. Yeah. Everything is through somebody's filter. Um, we get what someone somewhere wants us to know and see like even when i watch right. a very uh left because i'm pretty left but very left-wing democracy now like democracy mm -hmm. now is very consistent they show you a very specific view <laughs> and god bless amy goodman love that white woman uh but her view is very specific and it's been the same for 10 years right like it's very specific so i am unsure as to 
I know that the coronavirus is very uh, contagious. I know that most people who get it, uh, it ranges from most people who get it, it's fine. And then there's something that occurs. And, you know, yeah, it might be you have a compromised system or something, but some folks had no history of anything. And then they're just dead. They're like, for three days, I have a fever. And then they get, you know, they're dead. I know that because I checked in with a doctor friend. I'm like, are people actually coming to your hospital dying? Because I don't know what's real. <laughs> right. But right. like that writing on that idea of like, it's only, it's predominantly killing us in really high numbers makes me really nervous. And I think I do have, I have had the thought that's why some places are like, fuck it, we're not closing. Yeah. I mean, I think it's one of those things where like, you know, it's one of those intention impact things. Like it doesn't matter what their intention is. That's certainly the impact, right? Like if you know that if this, I mean, if Brian Kemp knows that people of color, black people disproportionately are dying from COVID and opens his, con and opens his state anyway, then it doesn't matter whether or not he was like, I'm going to kill the black people. <laughs> At the well, end of the day. A little bit, but I hear what you're saying. I think it's still like. Well, the, 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 reason I say that doesn't is be, the reason that I say that it doesn't is because I think that we just have to operate off of the perspective that all systems of power in this country live with that intention at their basis because that's the formation of the United States of America is either black people will be sub subjugated to us or they will die. That is the foundational premise from which we're starting. So I don't think we need to quibble about whether or not one individual is invested. If that individual is invested in ascending to the highest levels of the political system that is the United States government, there is a level of buy-in to that. To that I, I, agree. I agree completely. I think, I think my difficulty, I agree completely. And I think my difficulty is having, um, you know, I have a I have a black Puerto Rican mother who doesn't know she's black. Um, mm. uh, votes Republican is a Trump supporter, and I think that the reason I push back a little bit, like I agree, but I think there's certain things that those of us who are in the trenches and have an understanding of what's on the underneath, what's in the foundation, take for granted that we understand, know that, and see that. And I think there's a lot of folks who don't hear that language, who don't hear what you just said very often, who have no concept that that's the girding, right? That that's the undergirding of certain ideas that at the end of the day, if you're black or native, you don't fucking matter. Um, you're right. But a lot of people don't see that. Like my mom is one of those folks. My mom really truly believes that uh, the most important thing is like anti-abortion, uh, the coming, the, the rapture is coming. Okay. Uh, you know, and um, that uh, those people who believe in anti-abortion and those people who believe in Christianity are not racist. They just believe in the Lord, right? They believe in the love of God. Um, and I think that, the, that she's not hearing enough of that, of that statement that you said, right? She's not reading, mm -hmm. your book, right? She's not reading your book. Like it's unfortunate right. that they gave it to her, but I'm sure it's still sitting on a bookshelf somewhere, you know, and it's just like, oh, my little queer daughter gave me this. That's great. You know? Um, so that's why I said, I think I, I agree with you. And we have to remember that there's just a lot of people out there who don't have that context. Absolutely. I think though that, I mean, at least from the framework of the work that I do, is that that there is there is a something that is underneath, right? Like there's there is you know the rapture is coming, and I'm against abortion, and the, you know like and that is why I vote the way that I vote, and those are the most important things. So the other things don't matter. Um, there's that lens, but I think that under that lens, the the other things don't matter is not. I don't believe that it's, it doesn't matter. It's that to interrogate them would be to interrogate the entire foundation of my world. Yeah, yeah, totally. Right? And, the trauma, it would be, and the trauma that... Right. She and the trauma that lives underneath. Right, you have to unpack all of it. All of it has to come up, right? All the roots of it, all, all of your own historical journey to, to your own sense of self-belief, the... the um, releasing the reins of control that like the idea of the rapture gives us, right? It's like, oh, well, somebody's coming to save me from this shit. <laughs> so I don't have to deal with it. So all I got to do is vote this particular way and I'm going to get saved from this shit, right? You're burned, but I'm going to heaven. <laughs> right. So there's an entire like... In, 
internal ecosystem that buries, you know, that has its roots real deep, 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 deep down in. And so it's, I don't think it's that, it's just that like, I can't let that in. If I were to let that in, I would have to be letting in the fullness of my life. I would have to be letting in the truth. And this illusion is way more comfortable. Yeah. You know? yeah I hear that. And I think, and I think that's where, I mean, the truth is, I think that's where many, many, many humans in general live. But certainly, um, you know, certainly those of us who just can't even find the, you know, like, can't allow ourselves to let in the experience, our own experiences, right? Because I'm like, if your mother let in, she would be letting in the experience of her own trauma as a Black Puerto Rican woman, right? <laughs> she would be letting in that trauma. And, and certainly... Right, to let in other people's trauma, to let in the truth of the way the world works, then to means to have to look at how that also is true for you. Right. And there are times when, you know, it's like I can't I can't let myself know that that train is coming because I'm not sure I could actually get off the track. I'd rather just pretend it's not here until it hits me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I really appreciate that framing uh, because it brings it, it for me it creates so much space of compassion for how difficult it is. And what it also does now is makes, as we were kind of going, I was listening to y'all go back and forth a little bit about Brian Kemp as an example of whether he was intentionally doing this. And to me, that really illuminates some really basic shit that gets in the way of willful ignorance when you chose to take a fucking job, right? You chose to take a political, right? So I have compassion for the day-to-day person, particularly women of color, particularly folks with more marginalized identities. That compassion flows easily. I have less compassion because that same framework is, is true, not exactly the same, I think, but it is not untrue that white men in this country and white women in this country have to look at the fullness of our own selves and who we are in it. And that in and of itself is peeling back lots of traumas. And so I think I would actually lean more towards saying, particularly for white folks or anyone that holds privileged, uh, privileged identities, that the unwillingness to look at the data in the face that says, unless we are actively interrupting these patterns, we are complicit in perpetuating them. So which open Georgia does mean, fuck it, kill black and brown people. Because he's unwilling to look at the data. And he's, he's just yeah. like, meh. And right. somebody, somebody did a cost benefit analysis, both for the economics and also for the po- politics around that. So whether it's a conscious intent or an unconscious intent, I think that being unwilling. What he named to open. Like, I don't know Atlanta. I ain't from the South, so I don't oh, know. But yeah, no, nail shops and gyms is a thing, yeah, right? Like, like, and tattoo parlors. I'm opening somebody with nail shops and gyms. Yeah. You're clearly, because he wasn't like, I'm opening golf courses and, <laughs> you know, and the uh, Daughters of the American Revolution Convention. It was not what he reopened. Yeah. So there's, yeah, definitely. Definitely. But so the thing that made that I thought of, Maureen, when you were talking, the first thing that that I say all the time, I deeply believe with my whole heart, is that like at the bottom of all white supremacy is white people's unhealed trauma, generational trauma. Like at the at the absolute foundation of all of it is y'all got a whole bunch of shit y'all just won't deal with. <laughs> like from way, 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 way back. Like the inception of how white people even arrived on Turtle Island, right? And so that for me, that 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 does allow me a place to to stay out of like constant rage with white people and just be like, I wish y'all motherfuckers would just go on ahead, do your ceremonies, get your therapists, <laughs> gather your cousins and get your shit together. <laughs> I don't know. think there's enough sage in the world. <laughs> 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 now once Amazon starts selling it, it'll be run out real fast. Uh, <laughs> Amazon Sage Prime <laughs> delivery. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, but there's there's yeah, there's just there's generational trauma, right? And karmic trauma. And like we want to get all woo-woo about it, right? Like there's there's so much trauma that needs to be healed. And white people's unwillingness to look at their own trauma just perpetuates trauma to everybody, right? It's just like, I will, it's trauma projection. It's like, I'm not looking at it, take it. <laughs> Everyone else, take it, right? Everyone else, deal with that. Um, so yeah, I think that there is, 
there is no way out of anything. It doesn't matter what the predicament is. I don't care if we're talking about whiteness. I don't care if we're talking about ableism or that. I don't care what area of our privilege or, or power positionality we're talking about. There is no way out of it without a willingness to, to examine our complicity, right? Like you've got to be willing to examine your complicity. And we've, and part of the reason that people don't examine their complicity is because we start from the premise and, that, and this is why I was saying that, like, the whether it's intentional or, or not, um, it, it just becomes this foggy conversation. Because as soon as it's intentional, you're diabolical, right? Like, that's intentional. If you just sat there and was like, we're going to kill all the nails in Atlanta. <laughs> we opening the nail salons, and it's a wrap for the Blacks. If th that's a level of diabolical evil, right, that certainly exists, right, but is like anything else on the extreme of humanity. The same way, you know, you know, there's, you know, whoever is the kindest, most generous, most amazing person is also on the extreme. And they too were fucked up. Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King Jr. Like still humans, still doing human shit, right? And so I think that getting into the conversation of like whether or not someone is diabolically evil keeps people from being willing to examine their complicity because then I'm diabolically evil. Most people, unless you're a complete total sociopath, can't actually sit with I'm diabolically evil, right? And so the question is, how am I complicit without it being an indictment on on my humanity, right? And given the fact that whiteness is so much about um about separation, about being separate from oneself and separate from all the rest of the, you know, interconnectedness of life, anything else that reaffirms separateness only reaffirms whiteness. And so mm -hmm. for me, the, the, the positionality is how am I complicit recognizing that complicity is something I was born into? I wasn't going to get a chance to not be complicit. Right. This system has the, the inception of this land assumes my complicity. There was no way around it. And so I'm not a bad person because I'm complicit. I'm trash if I just decide to keep it. Yes. Like Brian Kemp sitting at the desk being like, well, great. That's just 10,000 dead black people. That'll work. That's, trash like that's definitely choosing to be with our lower selves right but but that's choice being complicit isn't actually a function of choice remaining complicit is a function of choice right remaining um you know oblivious to the impact that you have on other people is a function of choice but actual complicity complicity complicitness right. however the fuck you say that <laughs> That's not a choice. You came here complicit because you you got birthed into this plane. And if we could get people to get that, then I think it would unhook that I'm a bad person because I'm complicit. And then people would just actually go on ahead and examine where they're complicit and be like, oh, I don't want to be complicit there no more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I struggle with, and this is my own work and I know this, but like, oof, I think that some people are I think they're knowingly evil. I, I, I don't, I don't, and I don't think it's as far in the end of the spectrum, at least the way that I heard you say it, that, that, that they're far in the end of the spectrum and it implies that they're lower in number. At least that's how my brain processed it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I have a hard time giving people that room. I don't know where mm -hmm. that comes from, but I just have a hard time giving like, I agree with you. I think there are, there are choices that are being made that I think are being made quite aware, quite aware of the impact, the impact of death, the impact of pain. It's that they don't give a fuck. Like, I don't think it's like an, a level of ignorance of not really understanding the impact. I, I, right. you know, and I know like even say that out loud, it's kind of like, then what do you do? Right. Like, I'm not trying to be all, Debbie Downer, but like, right. I think part of what has gotten me stuck in for years, um, attempting to do work with white people that I will no longer do is, mm -hmm. um, giving them too much of the benefit of the doubt that it's ignorant mm -hmm. or that it's, uh, that you're just not, 
fucked up. Because I honestly, I think generationally, like the amount of if we talk, if we talk about, if we talk about epigenetics and the impact that that had, like you know, in my world, we're always talking about the impact of slavery on Black folks in America, mm-hmm. right? And how it impacts how we move in the world, how we raise our kids, the relationships we have, you know. And it comes up. I'm in a, I'm in a relationship with another Black woman, right? So uh, it comes up, right? And we talk about yeah. the ways in which we engage with each other. That we're like, where the hell did that come from? And we have to unpack that. So mm-hmm. the same, like, and but the same has to be true for white folks, right? And the let, like, but there's a certain point where I can't. I just feel like I give them too much if I if I say like, oh, it's it's um, you know, you just don't know better, or it's like you have a choice in this, or it's just complicity. Like, I don't know. There's something about that language that I'm having a hard time with because I think it lets them off the hook too much for some folks. I think that's true for some folks, but like there are people in power who run, like I just recently learned the whole thing about Jeffrey, Jeffrey Epstein. Mm. And I know everybody else knows, but I don't watch news. Like I I don't, I don't have social media. I don't watch news. I don't, because I think humans are scourged. Like at some point Mother nature needs to remove us (laughs) from the fucking planet. I don't know how it's going to happen, but I think it does need to happen. But I, so I don't watch news because I feel like it makes me hate humans more. If I don't watch news, I can have a level of compassion and humanity for other humans. But I recently learned, recently as in in the last two days, learned about Jeffrey Epstein. I think mm. um, and the, the, the ring that he had and like all the people involved in that child trafficking ring, like that's some evil shit. I, you can't, there's nothing you can tell me that'll tell me that that's not evil. That's some evil fucking shit. And people are well aware of what they're doing. Uh, well aware of that. He was doing that, but still got on his plane, still go to his, you know what I mean? Like I can't take, you know what the fuck you're doing. You know what you're doing. And I think that's the Like we're not allowed to have that conversation. When people have that conversation too much, you end up disappeared. You end up dead. You don't, you, no one knows where you are. Now Deidre's gone. Right. Well, did Jeffrey Epstein out loud? You know, like, it's like, what the fuck? That's, <laughs> that's the reality. But that's where I think I'm like, it's to, at some point, at some point, I, 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 yeah, white people need to really fucking figure this shit out, but I don't know that I have faith that they will because it's so deep. Because even if you want to talk about white supremacy, yes, there's some crazy shit that generationally they need to deal with, some karmic generational lineage shit. But then throw in their patriarchy and what white men did for centuries of trying to annihilate women from the earth and when you start doing that research that shit is fucking insane is insane what they like you know they practiced the ways in which they tried to keep black people um tortured black physically tortured black people in the united states during slavery this shit was practiced on on women called witches for centuries That, how does that not fuck with you and not make you evil? Like, you just fucking evil. I don't understand. Like, I can't. I'm like, I can't give them that space. I don't know how to do it. I, I'm, I'm, I, I pray for myself every morning. I'm like, Lord, give me some fucking more love and compassion. And I turn on the news for like two minutes and it's gone. <laughs> I, I hear that. What, what I think for me, I think there are a couple of things. One, I don't see complicity as a just as or as an off the hook, right? Like, you're not off the, like, because you were born into something doesn't make you not responsible for fucking undoing it. Like, you're not like, oh, well, I was born into that. There's nothing I can do about it, right? Like, no. It's, yes, you were born into that. And your assignment, your assignment as a, as a contribution to humanity is to fucking undo the shit that your people created that you were born into, that's the assignment. And so there are, there's a set of I white folks, need right? people to step up and do that assignment. That will make me <laughs> I, need to, I need more people doing the homework. We all need more people doing that. I mean, that's the whole point, is that we need more people doing the homework. But the problem is, if we assume that all of it is evil, then there's then you're right. There's no one's gonna do the homework. Yeah. If what if if what that means is I am just evil, who's ever gonna do the homework? So I don't actually think, whether or not I agree with you or not, I don't think it's the strategy that actually gets anything done. Yeah. And that's- oh, I, I agree 100%, but I'm being honest in terms of 
what this, how you feel. what the country yeah. does to me. even me. I'm a very loving person. I got hella white friends. Like you know, as fucked up as that might sound, I do. I got hella. White <laughs> I love I love being white people. I got some close working white people in my life, and I'm very specific about the close white people in my life because it, this world makes me completely suspect of everything about them. I'm like your own fucking way of being makes me have to like readjust my brain to not think you're fucking evil. And I don't right. think that that's understood because we don't talk like, you know, people don't talk like this because everyone's afraid what that's going to do. I don't work for nobody. Right. Myself, I'm giving right. <laughs> I ain't got no job to leave. I ain't got no job no more. Everyone <laughs> fucking cancel my shit. So fuck you. Thank you, Corona. Now I can speak my truth. But like, it doesn't, you know what I mean? Like, I get what you're saying. And I'm saying, I'm just sharing, like, literally yeah. that, like, it's a mind fuck. Like, I, I yes, everything you're saying makes sense. And then my body is like, no, fuck that shit. They just all evil. Fuck that shit. Fuck that shit. They evil. <laughs> I mean, I think that I think that's I think that's true for a lot of black people, and I think black people in general grapple with that, right? Because there is, there are, there is, there are people in our, there are white people in our. We are on this Zoom with a white person we love, right? And so there is the, the tension that is like, I don't know if y'all ever gonna get that shit together, and. Right, because y'all, that shit might just be in an eight, and then, and then the like, and then the reminder that 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 somewhere that just isn't possible because there are white people that I love who do choose to do the work, which must mean that somewhere, 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 somehow, there's some who are down to do the work. Well, I fucking hope there's still some of us left by the time they get it to work together. <laughs> You know, but that's the part of, the, but I think that's part of, like, for me, that's why I can't actually spend a lot of time worried about whether or not white people get their shit together. Because if I was waiting on that shit, yeah. if we was waiting on that shit, it'd be a wrap. <laughs> it would have been a wrap for us if we was waiting for white people to get their shit together before we decided to figure out yeah. what liberation looked like for ourselves, right? And I say that right? more jokingly than anything else, because the thing that they're most, like, that I know a lot of white folks in the United States are afraid of, but, and it's true, is, like, we actually outnumber them globally. Yeah. Well, white people are, I think there's a deep, deep fear that, that white people will eventually, that people will do to them what white people have done to people, right? Like, that's the, that's the underlying fear is, one day the tables is going to turn, the numbers is going to look different, and all this shit, we're going to have to reap what we sow, you know? And there's, wild, but I think we were made that way, it would have happened already. In the and that's my point. I was like, if, <laughs> if, if black people was going to kill y'all for the shit you would be, no, 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 you'd be dead, or white people would cease to exist. If white people, if black people were exactly who we are in the white imagination, white people would cease to exist. Mm -hmm. um, why? And so, you know, I think it's this, it's this, you know, it's a, it's a fear of their own shadow, right? That's really what it is. It's, it's like, oh, I recognize that there is a, a karmic imbalance. I recognize that there is shit that rightfully should be coming back to me and it ain't come back yet. And so I live shook. And so that's the collective white fear that we feel is whiteness being shook because it knows that yeah. there is a big reckoning. Yeah. But what I think what they fail to realize is that that day of reckoning is within themselves. That's not actually, it's not, it is not actually a thing that the external world is going to do. It is that that way of being in the world is so wildly toxic that you will never know peace, which is why you out getting arrested on the monkey bars is why you is <laughs> why you like i don't care about COVID. like literally i saw somebody on the news he was like i had triple bypass surgery and uh uh i mean all manner of things triple bypass surgery and chronic heart failure and i'm going back to work I, and i was like yo like whatever it is that you are running from inside yourself that would have you take this kind of risk right. is We're also horrible. brainwashing. There's a lot of brainwashing yeah. going on. All right. But you can only be brainwashed if you are running from something. Like somebody can't just implant an idea in your brain that there has to be space. And that space is the space in which I believe we are running from ourselves. Like that's what makes us susceptible to that is there is something I must be lacking where, what can fill it. Right. So, yeah. I, you know, 
complete aside, there are moments when you move, it looks like you have a tiara on with like, <laughs> with like That's, yeah, it's That's her Eiffel that. Tower tiara. <laughs> oh, it's this. Oh, it's my uh. <laughs> I think that makes me look like men on films. Hated it. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's that hilarious. amazing. I, um, um, I, I, you know, I was thinking about when you said that the so much of the work is within, and I, it's funny, it's counterintuitive, but for a long time, and every and every now and again, I occasionally grapple with it, but for the most part, it's it's uh, more in my past. But the the fear of being discovered was what kept me from being really honest about thoughts and beliefs that I had. And then I'd keep really busy, like running a school or teaching to, to, do, to help do better. But the work was always out here. And once I actually just really came to terms with, oh, I've been brainwashed from day one and my work is to undo my brainwashing, I actually felt tremendous peace. Mm-hmm. Like it was mm-hmm. really, like it really, like all of the times that like my throat would close up or, or I might, you know, I would just be so afraid I'd be frozen. That really diminished. Like, I'm just not really afraid to say anything anymore. And some, and sometimes that means I'm not afraid to say anything like, um, racialized, right. I was conditioned as a white person to just like, well, we don't talk about race because, you know, civil rights movement happened. We're beyond that. Um, and I, I don't feel uncomfortable even really well that's not true sometimes I feel uncomfortable but certainly not uncomfortable enough to not say something right and that used to be something that would stop but even more importantly like I'm just like oh it's another how not if moment how is race and white supremacy and patriarchy playing out in what I'm doing not whether it is and I just like my shoulders went down I was just like oh okay there's actually some easefulness which like I said is counterintuitive because it feels like the 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 way in which uh, the way in which I think white supremacy has us either be right or wrong, either or, right? That, that forced uh, either side of not even the honoring a pendulum, right? But just like- Yeah, just a binary. It's, yeah. It's this or that. That that is part of why I think it's so hard for people to, for, particularly for white people to step into that because you have to undo that basic premise of, oh, we can be all of those things. I can be a really good person and also have brainwashed- Um, terrible beliefs around black people and also have internalized misogyny and like I can have all of those things and still be a good person was a huge uh, breakthrough for me but like I said it actually just brought tremendous peace which was not something I anticipated (laughs) yeah well I think there's something there's a gift in being uh, being allowed to be fallible Right. There's there's a a deep piece in that. I did a workshop uh, or I was doing a speaking engagement in Canada and, you know, a woman stood up and she was just like, you know, I'm just I'm really just so stressed out because I'm, you know, I want to make sure that my that my kids grow up and that they just have the right ideas and that they're, you know, like I just am so afraid of that. I'm going to, you know, I'm that I'm going to fuck it up. And I just started saying, I was like, you go fuck it up. (laughs) And I said, once you just go on ahead and give yourself over to that truth, then it actually becomes a lot less stressful. You will fuck it up. You are going to get it wrong. You are doing something that involves centuries of conditioning, attempting to de-indoctrinate ourselves from centuries of conditioning. That is an imperfect, messy process. And if there is not some space to allow that to be an imperfect, messy process, and for as best as possible to learn how to contain your mess. Not that you won't make a mess, but like, have you, have you learned how to clean up quick? And have you learned how to contain your mess to some specific spaces so it doesn't spill out on everybody else? That to me- Don't, don't be the, reckless. Like, don't be reckless. Don't be reckless, mess, mm-hmm. right? Um, if you can manage That's that part, the rest of the self-awareness. Wait, say that. Say yeah. it. it's it's hard. I just want to be um, to take a moment for the audio. It's hard. I, I, I'm, let me be honest. I was grappling with saying this because culturally, I didn't want to be on some like white people one at a time shit. And it's hard to hear when both of y'all are talking. And so I just want to make sure the audio translates. I wanted to hear what you said, D. Sorry. No, I was just saying what you were saying, Sonia. About uh, I agree, and it but it, it takes a level of self awareness that we're not taught. 
you know, yes. and, and, and also I get like, we run from that, you know, the more you're aware of yourself, the, the more likely you might find things you don't like, which then also moves you to shut it down. Right. And like not want to deal with uh, what you find. If you, if you have the assignment that what you find defines you, that's the piece, right? That like, if what I find means I'm a shitty person, if what I find means I'm evil, if what I find means I'm horrible and going to forever be detached from people that love me, I won't be loved, then right, we just never going to look at shit. Agreed. But people, and people need to be taught, like what I'm saying is people are not taught, but that's a process. Like even to be able to say like that, like that's some next level shit. Like someone's not going to be able to just get there and be like, well, what I find, like that's therapy. That's a therapist. That's like, and the that is, of, I'm about to give you the quick version. Right that is called the body is not an apology. The power yeah. of radical self love is chapter four. I already wrote, wrote it for you. <laughs> I'm out here to help people get there so you don't have to struggle. <laughs> Good and I'm thank you for doing that. No, seriously, like I'm serious <laughs> thank you for doing that. And that but that's that like people need that because it's not I think like those of us who are constantly in the work of doing of being introspective, of, of being self-aware, of like right. um trying to make sure that our emotional labor is, you know, where it's supposed to be and not supposed to be, you know, and the work that we're trying to do to to be vulnerable and not be vulnerable and all that kind of stuff. Um it's a process. And I think, but it's like something that I know I had to discover, um, you know, on my own. Um, mm -hmm. That was, I know was, it was, I thank God every day that I was born black, queer, masculine or center, because that created a person that had to do these things, like to survive, had to do these things. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I know for other folks that uh, it is, it does not come natural. It is, uh, it, they need books like yours and they need to know, you know, and, and need, to have, need to have white folks in their life like Maureen who will get them to even pick that book. Book up. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, you know, if, if ever reference Jesse Jackson's words were useful, each one teach one is exactly that. Right. I mean, but that is like, as we get it, like passing that on. And I think that's the thing that we're certainly I'm always saying to white people is like, when I'm saying go get your cousins, that's what I mean. It's like, if you've got information, if you have an awakening that, that suddenly you understand and see the world more clearly, it is your absolute human assignment to go and get the rest of your people. Like, and if you're not doing that, then you're failing. Then you might as well, then you're still in your whiteness. You're not, you haven't undone shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, that makes me want to ask you about what happened to you recently, because I feel like you gave some folks an assignment at sort of at the end or at somewhere in the process. Uh, but we, we wanted to kick off these podcasts just asking folks how whiteness is showing up during coronavirus. <laughs> And uh, you had something really extraordinary happen. Yeah, it was funny. So I do these videos on Instagram called What's Up Y'alls, where I have a thought and then I just turn on my camera and I start talking. And one of the thoughts that, uh, I had, one of the What's Up Y'all videos was about how this idea of going back to normal is actually a terrible idea. Uh, that, <laughs> that, no that we had really normalized some abnormal shit, um, some really... You know, we had normalized greed and extraction and violence and disconnection and inequity and injustice. And that is what our normal was. And that actually we have an opportunity to create something new, right? And that this universal timeout that we've been given um, is really an opportunity to be like, what do I want to take forward? And what, what can I choicefully leave behind? Because it wasn't serving me anyway, both on the individual level and the collective level. So my uh, social media manager, Shannon, turned it into a meme. Uh, and, and, and it is basically what I just said. Uh, and that meme seemed to go a bit viral. It was spreading around. People were messaging me. Oh, my gosh. Am I, I saw this on LinkedIn today, Sonia. And I was like, oh, that's me. Cool. Um, and then I just kind of went on about my business, managing whatever <laughs> I was over here managing. And then I started getting messages that were like, I saw your meme today, but, um, but it had Brene Brown's name on it. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, well, did you? And so I started getting these DMs, mostly from white people saying, like, I saw your meme. 
it, it felt like tattling, like the white people yeah. were telling them the white people, somebody took your name off your meme. And I was like, did you correct them? Like, what did you, rather than coming and tattling to me and my DMs, like I'm supposed to chase down every digital imprint of the, you know, of the meme that got created. Did you correct the person that you saw? Um, oh, I'll go back and do that. And I was like, how is that not the first thing? <laughs> so it was just this fascinating moment, one, where it was like, right, white, whiteness expects me to do the labor, right? Like, whiteness was like, oh, but, and, like, I get the cookie for telling, yeah. right? But I don't have to do the work. I don't have to do anything around creating that, right? And I, or correcting that. And so I thought, I was like, that's hilarious. And I was like, I'm not chasing, I'm not about to be the internet police about this meme. I'm not doing that. So if you see it, please correct it. Well, then, Somebody, they went so far as to take a picture of Brene Brown and then take my words and put it on Brene Brown's face. Shut up. They literally white-faced my whole shit. Like, white-faced the quote. It's like Brene Brown staring off into the distance <laughs> with my, all my words, with all my words over her face. I was like, this is been Like, so for me, it was so fascinating. One, the like, oh... This was something that deeply resonated with me. A, m a white person must have said it, right? <laughs> so however it is that the words got, however it is that my name came off of it, but then that it became Brene Brown, but then that it had to become Brene Brown in physical body, right, um, was f fascinating to me. It was so fascinating. Uh, and so it went around far enough that Brene Brown saw it. Her team saw it and was like, this is not my, <laughs> these are not my words. And, you know, I thought it was interesting. Her tweet said, you know, like, after doing some digging, and I was like, you really wouldn't have had to dig if you just put the words in the, <laughs> if you just put the words in Google, <laughs> the original quote would have come up with my name on it, because uh, the body is not an apology, it has hundreds of thousands of followers. So that's not digging. But okay team had to dig. Anyway, we wanted to cite, you know, like it, this quote is from Sonia Renee Taylor. It's important that we cite people correctly. Uh, and so that sort of sent the, the quote back into circulation. And then, uh, then the tattletales back into my DMs, right? So <laughs> it's just this very interesting cycle. But what I got to personally, and I ended up doing a What's Up Y'all video about this, was like, my assignment is to do the work and to trust. And it's not even like, and I say trust in the like universal sense, not in the human sense. It's not about trusting humans. Humans will be human. Um, but in the like divine energetic sense, to trust that whatever it is that is supposed to happen with those words is going to happen with those words. And there's a, a level of releasing that I have to do once they're out in the world. Um, including releasing if if a racist white supremacist society decides to take my name off of it put a white woman's face on it and then put the words over top of her face there is a part of me that is not that is not to actually be concerned with that and to trust though that whoever is supposed to be concerned with that will be concerned enough that it will get rectified which is what happened and there was, I feel like there's the balance between what am I supposed to do that's about me and then what am I supposed to do when it's about the other? If the other, if, if Deidre's words had been misattributed and they were out here saying that, I don't know, uh, who, I don't know, Glennon Doyle wrote it or whoever. <laughs> I was like, I can't hardly even think of a white lady. Uh, <laughs> but then, then my responsibility at that that moment is to have Deidre's back, is to go and be like, that's no, that's not who wrote that. And I'm going to need you to put Deidre's name on there appropriately. Um, but, and to trust that somebody was going to have my back in that way so that it wasn't my labor to go and do. And that's what happened, you know. And so since then, the, now the quote is appropriately attributed to me. Viola Davis shared it. Representative Rashida Tlaib did it, mentioned it in a speech. It showed up at ABC News. Or, so it's, it has created its own energy. And part of that was about me releasing my grip on what it needed to be. And sometimes I think we hold whiteness so tight, 
right? Like the controlling whiteness, the like need to make whiteness correct itself so tight that we miss what is our lesson, black people, right? And like, so there is a way in which I, I can't be the white supremacy police and I can't, I'm not gonna be out here chasing down whether or not white people are doing right, right? I'm gonna do right by me and I'm going to trust that those in my community will have my back around that. And because when, I, cause when I'm over there focused on being the white supremacy police, I'm not actually focused on my divine assignment. And my divine assignment is not just dismantling white supremacy. It's not. Should that happen as a result of my divine assignment, great. But that's not the, that's not the label of it. <laughs> uh, and so I need to be over here doing what I'm supposed to do and let whiteness sort its shit out. And trusting, again, in the universal sense, not in the human sense, in the universal sense, that whatever is my path is gonna be my path. So that, that, was, that was the lesson that I got from it at the end of the day, but I thought it was fascinating. <laughs> You're so wonderfully positive and loving, so. <laughs> Almost foreign. It has taken a lot of work. I described, um, I was telling a friend the other day, like, I feel like I'm having this, I don't know, I'm, I'm in an experience, <laughs> a very intense experience over the last uh, two months, month and a half. Um, and I said that what I feel like, I don't know if you, when you extract the venom from a snake, you have to press its mouth up against a glass and it presses the venom out, right? And that's how you like get the venom out of the snake. And I feel like that's what's happening to me is that the universe is like, ain't it, Sonia, ain't it? <laughs> and it's draining out all of my venom, right? And, and it's an uncomfortable and wildly uh, unnerving process because my venom is my protection. It's how I see myself protected in the world. As a Scorpio, <laughs> literally the poison is how I protect myself. Um, but there is something in this moment that is, that is telling me that I don't need that level of protection anymore mm-hmm. um, and that there's something else for me to do. Mm-hmm. And so I'm just trying to, like I said, I'm trying to do, do my assignment. That's all I I'm trying really to do. I appreciate you doing your assignment. <laughs> I mean, I believe that, you know, I, I think that everyone's supposed to walk their own path. Like I, I, and I didn't mean that. I meant that very lovingly. Like, you know, I, 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 do, I, I do. And <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, there needs to be people in the world of varied stripes and colors and interactions. Um, we need all kinds. You know, so, <laughs> I, and I will, will not walk the path you're walking. Like, that's, you're walking a beautiful path, but it's not my path. Uh, you give a lot more grace to this thing, this construct than I think I was ever meant to or will ever. Uh, so I appreciate that. But I think there's a balance. You know, I, 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 yeah. Appreciate that you're doing that work. Thanks. It's needed, it's necessary. And I sure the fucking doing it. So thank you for doing it. <laughs> Glad to do my part. Whatever that is. <laughs> well, there's different flavors of medicine, and I appreciate yeah. y'all both being the medicine. <laughs> um, I know I've I've definitely been uh, deeply moved and inspired by both of you, but. Um, even as someone having to continue to unpack the ways in which uh, whiteness shows up in me, whiteness shows up in um, the actions that I take. I've benefited from some harsh, harsher, unfiltered truths, and I've benefited from some more graceful, compassionate teaching. And I have also seen both of you do both of those things. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's interesting. It's like, I'm realizing, you know, I think that there, I don't know that at this point, you know, as old, I'm not old, but I, you know, I'm not 20 anymore. So I'm like, I, I don't think, I think that there's uh, folks who have been, um, you know, uh, my, my, my outlook on life is that we choose our struggles before we get here. Right. We, that, mm. I believe we make a choice of like what family we're going to go into and what it is that we're attempting to learn while in physical body. And I think that there's absolutely a, a, a choice I made. Um, and I think we all make. And I think right now, what I see is what I held like your mirror, not really a mirror, but you're showing me, uh, Sonia, which I deeply, deeply appreciate is um, 
just really helping me as I'm sitting here listening to you, helping me have a lot of grace and compassion for my own path. Because there were points where you're speaking and I'm like, oh, that's really beautiful. Like in my, you know, there's this like, the shadow in my head is like, looking beautiful and glowy. Oh, good for her. You know, and I'm sitting here in my head and I'm just thinking, what is that? Because I adore you. Like it would be harder if I didn't like you, but I like, right. adore, you know, so I'm like, what is that? And I just realized, but it, it helped me like, oh, you don't need to be like that. Like as much as you, like, and the loving of that is what, it's my homework for you, right? Like you said, like to have your back, my way of having your back is just loving you and being like, that's beautiful. Like I appreciate what you're offering the world in the way that you were so kind of on off, you know, um, hands off about the process. And I think about the, the quote, the whole quote in Brené Brown. And I, I think I would have been too, but with a little bit more snarkiness. Um, I think a lot more, a lot more snarkiness and a lot more cusperous, but, um, uh, <laughs> But I think what it, what, it, what it showed me is like to have, in order to have that level of love and compassion for your path, I, I in my head, have to have it for my own and just being okay with, um, no, like my path is not that. My path is actually an agitator. Like I, my path is at times, I there, so, there does need to be someone out there who is actually not so graceful and loving with the way whiteness has a stranglehold on us. Like sometimes someone needs to be there to be like, put your fucking hands on me one more time. And yeah. you know, there's yeah. be a movie made right here. <laughs> you know, so, um, and I don't mean violence. Like I'm verbal. Like I will verbally dress someone down. And, and I hold that a lot because I want people to learn. Um, and that was part of what I was, when I was watching you and listening to you and watching you, I'm like, you know, learning a lot, but also, just really realizing of like, oh, we each have our path and like, it's going to take, if, you know, that we keep throwing in sayings, but that it takes a village. Right. Uh, but it takes all take of like a huge village to, uh, I'm with you. I don't think, I don't think white supremacy is ever going to be dismantled. I think that the earth will dismantle humans and therefore white supremacy will be dismantled. <laughs> But I think that we can transmute it, right? I think that there are ways in which we have to be much more conscious about how it's moving through it. Like I know uh, yeah. one of the things we brought up for me when you were talking was like me thinking, oh, my work is to figure out how is white supremacy moving through me? Cause I can't, my, the way my personality is and the way I look and the way I move in the world, I can't, I can't be overly concerned with what white folks are doing because I will go to jail. I will exactly. go to fucking jail. So my thing is, but I don't bother it. Like, I'm like, I was born here. Like white supremacy runs through patriarchy and white supremacy runs through this body all the time. And it's deep and it's quiet. Sometimes mm -hmm. other times it's blaring, you know, even relationship with you, Maureen, like there's times where like you, like, you, I don't know if you, you've never done it. Um, I know as you work through your own white supremacy, like you've never done it, like checking me, but you definitely have shown me like, Ooh, that was some white supremacy shit coming out of my mouth <laughs> you know, as the black person in the, in the union that's doing this, you know, transmutation work around how do we move as more human to each other? Like in a more humane way, how do we really see that, uh, when I'm looking at you, I'm looking at me, right? When I look at me, I'm looking at you. Um. And that's so that's hard. But like, I know for me that the work is just, I'm like, I, I got enough right here to just unpack here. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate folks who are like out in the world holding that space and like, you know, patient with your DMs of like, well, could you go? Because I would just not respond to the DMs. You're like, what the fuck? I would do, do something. And I wouldn't teach nobody. <laughs> I'm sure there, there were some that got ignored, right? There were some that I was like, I mean, oh, don't get, don't get it twisted. The deletes happen quick over here. Like, uh, I will just, yeah, goodbye. You, you don't actually even energetically exist in my space. Goodbye. Uh, so, you know, and, you know, there used to be more cussings out. I don't cuss people out anymore because I just don't have, it, it takes energy. Yeah, it's, yeah. And, and I reserve my energy for whatever, like I said, for my divine assignment, right. which is not, you know, there are people that cuss out. We have other arrangements that allow right. this. Thing. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> Randoms don't get to just show up and take that kind of energy anymore. So, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also am thinking, though, it's really, you know, Deidre, as I think about our course on intersectional leadership, I'm really, I, and having known you for so long, Sonia, and seen, been able to bear witness to so much of your evolution, both internally and then what you're bringing to the world, I'm actually really struck by the lesson that 
when we do the work within, how much more space it actually opens up for us to be able to stand in our fullest power and for whatever that assignment is, right? And not power in a hierarchical way, but just power in who we who are who we authentically are and what our uh, what's the word I want to use our our most um, our deepest gifts, I guess. Mm-hmm. Is what I want to say, and so it's it's interesting because. There was a time, like you said, you might be cussing people out or whatever. There was a time where all that energy was there, but then it actually dwindled capacity, right? Mm-hmm. So once, you know, you're using this as an example, but I think you've been doing it for years now. Once the, the instinct was, well, start here, do my own work, then we'll go out here. Mm-hmm. You've actually just really um, been able to have so much more capacity for yeah. the world. Well, because those things that used to happen externally, because it's, it's exactly what Deidre was just talking about, right? Where it's like, oh, that thing comes up that's like, ah, whatever it is, right? But whatever it is, it's got that face on it. And it's like, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and what it's always, it's always actually asking, what, is, what am I not bringing here, right? Like, that's what that is. And so when I would bump up against that in the digital world or online or on Facebook or whatever, it was always just saying, like, there's a reason that that's in you like that. There's a reason that that irks you in the way that that does, because it's actually kicking up something for you to work on that's just about you. And once I work through that, then that stuff just doesn't even irk me anymore. And that's how it gets just deleted. Like, oh, you don't even occur to me as a place to put my energy. Um, but, but there are still times when I bump up against something and I know it's a, a thing because it shows up. Like, oh, that's, oh, that's, that's, that's got me. Okay. I just have the practice today of being like, if that's got me, then there's something in here to mm-hmm. check on. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I think as I understand the distinction between dismantling white supremacy or patriarchy or any of the forms of oppression, the distinction between dismantling and actually transmuting, I feel like that's actually an incredible example of yeah. like, if I'm dismantling something, I'm at war with the external, with but, the if external. I'm, but I'm transmuting, I'm starting from within and seeing then what's possible. Right. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's way less exhausting. Like when I was walking in the world thinking uh, it was my responsibility, uh, which made me a very angry person, which made me very, you know, quick to cuss at people or uh, verbally, like I could, you know, I was, I've been schooled in, in, in white schools and in like super, um, what is it? Uh, Super academic ways of being. So I can, very easily dress someone down verbally and never use a cuss word, be so respectful and gentle about it. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like the epitome of whiteness. Um, But I've learned that like, it doesn't, it, that sits with me longer than I, well, it sits with me. Like, I don't even know if it sits with the other person. Just like what I learned was like, when it sits with me having done that, I don't like the way that feels. You know, like it, it takes away from my experience of the joy I'm seeking to find um, with the beauty in the world I know does exist. Uh, and so the transmuting is a way of, it's a little bit, it's almost selfish, right? It's a selfish way of moving because it does make more space, right? It actually creates a, a letting go and a loosening of the ties of the construct you're trying to move through because it doesn't get, it, you don't give it that power to determine how you're moving, what you're right. doing, how you're saying it, you know, what your reality is and, and is not. And it, it's very, it's very freeing. It's hard sometimes to remember like I said, like I appreciate, I deeply, I have so much respect for you, Sonia, in terms of so many things, but how much you're on, I, I assume you're still on social media like you were when I was on social media, but like when I, I literally am, I, that's still my Achilles heel. I think that's what, one of those things where I'm like, no, I think in this life, I'm just not meant to be on social media. Uh, and that's okay. But that, that's because oh, that's okay. painful. like, yeah, you want to do some serious growth and transmuting, just fucking fall into somebody's comment section right (laughs) lots 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 yeah yeah I do a lot less like I said I don't I do a lot less external like it's no longer about like trying to to get someone to do something it's like here's my reflection about my own life my own revelation hey if it's something for your journey awesome if it's not 
Yes, it is going to. It's beautiful. Thank yeah. you for being that vulnerable and sharing because uh, you know it goes back to uh, you know like I know my goal, my my role and purpose is to write fictional stories that other queer Black women can find themselves in, mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think you said. Like that's it's and and because it because there's something really beautiful about not feeling alone. You know, like, and like yeah. all the reason we spend so much time on social media is that we're so disconnected and longing for belonging. And uh, so when you share something from your heart at a vulnerable place and it's about me, of course, it's going to speak to someone else. And it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's not only food for yourself, for your own soul, but it's food for so many other people's soul because we are all connected. We just have forgotten. Yeah. 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 Hmm. So to wrap, basically, mind your business. <laughs> you can't force anybody to do anything. Uh, so just keep working on you. But inadvertently, that opens up some space for people to choose. Uh, we're all at fucking choice. So stop acting like you got it all figured out over here. Harumph. <laughs> and uh, shut the fuck up and listen to black women. That's sort of my takeaway. Wash your fucking hands. You wash, and your, wash legs. Your, wash your legs. your legs. your legs. Just go for the whole body. Can we just, just go for the whole body? Just, yeah, all the parts. All the parts with no, flesh. No. I bought a long brush. Now, and it's See? like weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, the first time I really, I kind of remember it was like the second or third time I went to a Korean spa to go get a scrub that the joke around or the realization around we white people don't wash their whole body like <laughs> that, that happened and i had an epiphany while it was happening i was like oh there are a lot of places i don't regularly <laughs> <laughs> you haven't had a korean scrub they get everywhere all the places all the places god bless the korean spa oh we may never have that again <laughs> single tear <laughs> Go to Atlanta. They opened it. Yeah. <laughs> it's open in Atlanta. Yeah. You can have what you want. It's always a trade-off. Yeah. Right. Twice. Yeah. You're willing to pay the price. Oh, Lord. <laughs> well, Zoe, thank you so much for making time to talk with us today. You want to tell anybody listening what you're up to, what folks should follow, how they get a hold of you, how to take in your brain? Um, yeah, sure. You should follow me on Instagram. It's Sonia Renee Taylor. Um, that's the only platform that I'm on currently, but you can follow The Body Is Not An Apologies work on all of the platforms, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, or you can visit our website, thebodyisnotanapology.com, or you can visit my website, SoniaReneeTaylor.com, and you should absolutely buy the book, The Body Is Not An Apology, The Power of Radical Self-Love, and not from Amazon, if you can help it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Most bookstores... Yeah, most, bookstores, most yeah. bookstores are still shipping. Like you just just find a bookstore in your area. And yeah, find your local bookstore. They'll get you the book. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Right on. And you have a second edition. I think you're working on. Is that right? There is a second edition and a workbook that will be out on February 14th of 2021. Nice. Mm -hmm. You nice. and your Valentine's Day book drops. I love yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Deeply appreciate you. I uh, deeply appreciate you both. Thank you so much for inviting me. Love you. Thanks for coming. Love you. Yeah. <laughs>